put all their money in a company to try and push the transition uh, to uh, renewables. So historically, they have started in case in 2004, established in 2006, um, and they only uh, started working abroad, KSA, uh, in 2012. So that's a very fairly new company in the, in the industry. Um, they started in Morocco, uh, did four uh, bids. The, four, the first four renewable projects uh, that the government has ever uh, tendered for, and they won the four of them. And this is how Morocco um, became a big platform for aquapower. And also, um, well, Aquapower became kind of an international company. Straightforward to now, um, Aquapower has more than 50 gigawatts of power, uh, renewable power and sold, uh, which is more than half of KSA uh, power, or, and more than the, the power of the entire country in the UAE, um, which is a huge success. Now, you can see that I like my company, but now let's talk more about um, why I think choosing a company that you uh, that um, aligns to your values is very important. So I'm an engineer. I started my studies, uh, I'm, I'm born and raised in Morocco. Um, I grew up in Morocco and went to France for my studies, um, engineering school. Um, and at the end of my master's, I was always wondering what I'm gonna do. Because I was in a good engineering school. I had a lot of opportunities, but then we don't actually um, learn at school how to uh, choose the right job for us. So one of the main, uh, let's say, KPIs is money and salary. Let's not lie to each other. So salary is a very big, um, uh, let's say, point of choice that a lot of people take into account. But they don't teach us um, to look at a company that has values that, that align with ours. So that's why I took a gap year, and I think this is very common in France, and I encourage you all to do that if you can. Took a gap year between my first and second years of master's to try out companies, try to have a job, try to understand what it is to be in a company, and to understand what I like and what I don't like about being part of an organization. So I tried two companies. One of them was Aquapower. Uh, and that was completely random. I just wanted to try uh, renewables in the Middle East, ended up in Aquapower, and that's another story for another day. And I tried consulting uh, in Africa, strategy consulting. So um, honestly, my choice was clear from that day. Uh, I, I spent six months here and six months there, and uh, it was clear to me that it's very important that my daily job, when I wake up in the morning, I spent time trying to make the, the world a better place. Um, I think all of you here who are present today share somehow this dream because otherwise you wouldn't be uh, like taking the time to, to listen to all of these people talk about their companies and what they're doing and sustainability in general. But if you are passionate about this topic, please don't let go of this important KPI when choosing what you're gonna do in the future. If it is entrepreneurship or being in a company, choose a company that you actually believe in and uh, whose values actually align with yours. So for Aquapower, when we started, we start, uh, well, when they started, because I was still young, <laughs> but when they started, they started as uh, a power company. So they were building power plants, gas power plants in Saudi Arabia. Um, but then one, once Aquapower grew, and especially with the platform that they had in Morocco that was a renewable uh, platform, they used that to convince the Middle East to switch to renewables. And they were one of the first pioneers of uh, pushing renewable energy um, in the Middle East. So that now we're present in Southeast Asia, China, Middle East, Africa, and CIS countries. So we're present in a lot of countries, but they started in their home countries, which are UAE, Jordan, KSA, Oman, um, and uh, in these countries, they have broken the record of renewable energy prices, I think six or seven times. We are in Guinness books. We, uh, Aquapower has been taught as, a, as a, a business case in Harvard Business School because it's a huge success to be able to drive down the price of uh, renewables as low, if not lower, than f fossil fuels. And this is what I call real impact and a step forward because Yes, of course, all companies are trying to have ESG goals and trying to uh, make sure that they consume less and be net zero by 
I don't know when, but for me, that who is in the industry, um, I realized that most of this is marketing. Um, and the way to drive this is to make this a, let's say, a core goal um, for the success of the company. And one of the one of the ways to do this is actually making your money out of this. Because Aquapower now, as you saw in, well, I think one of the slides, has 86% of its portfolio that is green. Um, and that's just because when we started, we started with, with gray power, we started with gas because that was what was in there. Um, and now we're only doing green, okay? Um, and also one second thing that I really wanted to talk about is always dream big. Because Aquapower started like less than 20 years ago. And when they saw an opportunity in green hydrogen, which was not their expertise at all, um, they took it. So we partnered with Air Products, uh, which is a very big chemicals company in the US, uh, to start the first green hydrogen project in Saudi Arabia. So we partnered with Neom. I don't know if you, I, I guess you might have heard about Neom. Um, so we partnered with Neom City uh, to get the land with Air Products who know a lot more than us in hydrogen and us who are experts in re renewables to make a green hydrogen project at scale. So this is a huge project. It's like a $10 billion investment. Um, and no one believed in us at the beginning. And I was part of the business development team because I led the, the development of the, of the power scope. So at the beginning, and I was early 2020, and it was <laughs> during COVID, which was, didn't help. But um, during that time, when we used to speak to other companies, to uh, other chemicals companies, to uh, developers, all of them were saying, green hydrogen doesn't exist. It's too expensive. It doesn't make sense. No one can do it. And then we worked for three years, <laughs> silently, not speaking about this to anyone anymore because we had an off-taker, Air Products. We had our partner who was giving us the land. We had the project. Made it work, financed our project, closed our project. And beginning of this year, we started the construction of the project. And then all of a sudden, everyone is interested in green hydrogen because there is a project. So we made our case. And this is the same thing with uh, PV back in 2010 or 2012 when uh, the, we closed the PV project at one cent per kilowatt hour. I don't know if that speaks to you, but like here, it's like six or seven times that. Um, we, closed, we closed at one cent uh, a project in, in, in Saudi Arabia, in Shuaiba. And everyone was shocked because then everyone was like, PV is so cheap, we can actually make it a, like our basic uh, energy source. And then a lot of people started looking at PV, even in Europe, where they don't have solar, <laughs> like they don't have the sun. But uh, everyone started looking at PV and it started making sense to everyone else. So my point is, a company like this who is driving the transition and pushing the limits um, is what dr drove me into staying in Aquapower or coming back to Aquapower after I finished my studies. Uh, and I'm sure there are other companies like that. I encourage you to learn more about Aquapower if you want. We're a fun uh, team. <laughs> We're a very big team, though. We're like 6,000 people now. But it's a very, it's a very uh, good environment to grow and foster in um, because, one, they encourage a lot of people to learn. There's no limits. Nothing is taboo. You can ask all the questions you want. You can make the mistakes you want, and that's fine. Um, and I think this is a very valuable um, KPI to take in, into account when you're choosing the company or what you want to work with. Or if you are an entrepreneur or you want to become an entrepreneur and you want to start something someday, make sure that these values are, are core in your company, even if you're a startup. Because when I say Aquapower family, it's because our chairman is basically our dad. He, he has always taken care of all of us uh, from the very beginning where the company was a startup in KSA in a very small uh, office to now where we're present in 14 countries um, where every single office of Aquapower feels like a family. And when you go inside that office, you feel like people take care of you. When you go on site and you see people actually building the projects that we develop, because I'm part of the business development team, so I only do the negotiations and design and everything, and then hand over to another team to actually do the, the, the construction. Even when you go on site, you see that people are actually all very proud to be part of this organization.
And I think it's very important to, to uh, make sure that when you talk about sustainability, it's not a, they were saying uh, before in the previous panel, it's not your minor. It's your actual full-time job uh, to, uh, to work towards a better planet. And, um, well, I don't like the, to use the word greenwashing, but a lot of companies, including companies we, we, we uh, were about to work with, were actually just uh, looking to, gr to greenwash their names. Tech companies, for example. There's something called uh, RECs, Renewable Energy Certificates, that, that any renewable project is getting uh, by producing power from green sources. Because that means that you're not producing CO2 that you might have needed to, to, to produce in order to produce the power f with conventional technologies. So they give you what we call Renewable Energy Certificates, and th there are agencies that certify all the projects that we have. And those ones can be sold for money so that they can help other companies offset their emissions. Um, this is an incentive that was created by, by, by Europe and it's gonna continue, I guess, um, to push people towards trying to like produce green power. But what happens is you will have the, in the Middle East people producing green power and American companies taking the, those RECs to justify their use of gray power. And we had American companies come to us wanting to buy our, our RECs, and the chairman said no, because that's not what we're doing. That's not the point. The point is to actually produce green power. It's not to greenwash people into thinking you're net zero, because what net zero means, it means that you offset the carbon that you use. It doesn't mean that you don't produce carbon. And I think it's very important for people to realize this, because um, a lot of companies actually talk about their net zero production by, I don't know what, um, this is not being a sustainable company. Being a sustainable company is actually being green, not producing anything. And I know here it says net zero as well. Oh, no. I think I think in this pre presentation there's a net zero somewhere. Um, but that's because it's PIF who did this video, not us. Uh, yeah. No, yeah, net zero. So net zero doesn't mean green. Aquapar is actually doing green power. Um, Anyways, apart from that, um, I know that there are a lot of people uh, that are present here that are about to finish their studies. If you're wondering what you want to do in the future, go to, uh, to, to, to fairs um, and hiring fairs all over the UAE, and I think there are a lot of them, to actually learn about the companies. And if I can give you an advice, always talk to your future manager, get to know them. Because in big companies or small companies, what matters above the fact that you need to have a company that actually has good values, you need to have a manager that you believe in, that you trust, and that can push you forward. Because apart from the actual like overall goals, then you have your own. And you need to be in an environment that is nurturing for you to grow. And especially these first years of your career are very important. Um, one of the reasons I chose to come back to the UAE because I was back in France. One of the reasons I chose to come back to the UAE and work with Aquapower, again, was my manager. Because I knew that it was a, he was a good mentor, that I can learn with him and I can grow. And that's very, 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 very crucial for your, for your careers, okay? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, don't be afraid to challenge the status quo. Uh, in Aquapower, we like to, to do this thing where we would sit with the CEO and just criticize him. <laughs> and I think this is very important to have, uh, to be able to have the flexibility to actually speak up your mind. Um, and I'm not only gonna talk about women, I think we are past the gender exclusivity thing. Women now have the power, they can do whatever they want. But still, we need women in this environment because, well, in my team, I'm the only woman <laughs> and I'm trying to hire more women. But um, the idea is, I feel like, it's not only companies who are preferring men to, to women, it's also women who are afraid to go into these tough environments, which I understand. But um, I, I really think that, especially for engineers and people that are really passionate about uh, having a, let's say, a steep career, it's very important for you to be able to work in male-dominated environments, um, which means sometimes hearing some 
unpleasant comments <laughs> that you can always speak up and answer to, um, which I always do. But um, it's it's very important to uh, try and focus on when when you're focusing on your career to focus on the people that are going to be da daily working with you. It's very important to have a good CEO. It's very important to have good leadership. And you need to look into that. And I encourage you all to look into that when you're choosing whatever company you want to go to. But make sure that the team you're going to be working with every day, the manager that you, that's going to be uh, evaluating you and, and coaching you is someone that you find smart and kind. Because if they're smart, you're going to learn. If, if they're kind, you're going to grow. Um, so... Yeah, I think uh, I talked a lot, <laughs> but um, really open to any questions. If you have any questions about aquapower, about renewables, about green hydrogen, or engineering, or anything else, I'm very open to uh, answering all your questions. If anyone wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, you're more than welcome. Imal bin Hayoun, that's my name. So, yeah, thank you for hearing me out. Do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? or comment, or suggestion. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Iman, for sharing what you do at uh, Aquapower. Up next, we have uh, the youth from the Arabian Youth Environment Program. Please come up on stage. It's here. Yeah, you can start. It's on the mic. It's fine, it's fine. We can do this. Um, sure, sure. Okay, you done. Okay, cool, cool. Let me come on this. Sure. No, it's not working. Uh, sorry, just bear with us for a moment. We'll fix the technical issues and we'll begin in a bit.
still look good on I mean, this looks pretty cool. Maybe I should connect to you. What's the, does he not have? We should come back. Hmm? We should come back. I hope he does. It's technically big time back. Let's go. Is it? Is it? All right. Um, sorry, everyone, for that delay. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Uh, good afternoon. Now I know we both look like kids here, and you're probably wondering why are there a bunch of kids on this podium? Uh, we're trying our best to hide it. Hassan here has a whole beard. <laughs> But we are only at the start of our uh, university journey, and we're here to give you examples of youth-led sustainability initiatives, including ours. And if you're interested to start one or be a part of one, we will guide you through it and, you know, hope you engage. Um, my name is Amir Sarfaz Hussain, and with me here is Hassan Nasser. We are the co-founders of the Arabian Youth Environment Program. Uh, we have partnered with these organizations to organize and bring to you Elkoi with all these other companies. So we are directly co-organizing and being a part of this conference, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to give you a brief introduction into ourselves, uh, Hassan and I both have a very similar background. For the past four years, throughout our high school journey, we've been going to conferences, working on research papers, finding debates, model UNs, climate policy conferences, and engaging through that. And eventually, we were like, we need to do something by ourselves. We need to actually go out and, you know, make our own thing, do it our way and help the environment and the country in our own manner through other means as well. Uh, so with that, we decided to co-found the Arabian Youth Environment Program. Um, hello. Yeah, I think it's working. Uh, hey, everyone. Again, my name is Hassan. And as Amir said, I'm one of the co-founders of AYEP. Um, again, we have very similar experiences. We have been working together for the past couple of years, and we have done a lot of things together. But our biggest achievement is the AYEP, the Arab Youth Environment Program. And I say this not just on a random basis, but on the basis of impact. Max working. Um, we have over 200 active volunteers working towards uh, helping our recycling campaigns, beach cleanups, park cleanups, and even environmental blogs and rep reports. We specialize in those, and that's mainly what we do. We are one of the largest youth-led environmental programs in the MENA region, and our main objective is essentially to raise awareness prior to implementation of our projects. And Elkoi is one of the main things that we are hoping to do, and we are really uh, proud and honored to be here. Um, we essentially love being a part of Elkoi, and it actually essentially aligns and parallels with our objectives and ideologies of raising awareness amongst the youth, because as discussed earlier, you cannot make a decision for the youth without concerning with them. And that's essentially our ideology. And on the same basis, we are here presenting Elkoi. Uh, more details on what AYP is, how we operate um, our projects and all the events that we host will be discussed towards the end of this presentation. Until then. Okay, so to give you a quick overview of what we will be talking about today, uh, we will firstly start out with what are youth-led sustainability initiatives. We will move on to how this aligns with COP28 and you know the policy output of it all in the UAE. We will then move on to Youngo, which has already been touched upon, but we'll 
make it relevant to our presentation. We will talk about the history, the present, and the future of youth-led sustainability initiatives in the MENA region. And finally, we will end by introducing ourselves to you formally as AYAP. All right, so the first question that comes to our mind is that why youth-led initiatives, right? It's a very relevant question because you can be like this COP28 happening and there are these uh, big agreements and treaties where country and world leaders, global leaders come, all of these political leaders who actually have influence, they have the funds and the ability to actually fees, uh, in a practical manner implement these policies. So why would you want youth-led initiatives? Like what's the point of that? Um, essentially, we believe that this happens for four main reasons. The first one is the stakeholder. We believe that the youth is a major stakeholder in environmental initiatives. All right. We believe that because the previous generations had done certain acts, which now we are facing the impacts of. All right. We would never have been in the situation where we enter the era of global boiling if the previous generation had been more courteous and they had been more careful of their actions and they had analyzed the impacts of everything they do. If the initial projects and innovations like building a car were initially thought that this is the impact that could happen from these innovations, and if the environmental impacts were kept in mind, then we would never have entered such a situation. To prevent this from further worsening and the upcoming generations not having to uh, face the same consequences that the current generation is facing, we have to work towards making a better world for them. Well, if you're making a better world for them, then why not concern with them? Why not ask them what do they want? And that is the entire point of having a youth-led initiative, that you actually hear out what do they want, you hear out how do they want to do it. Because on, on to the second point, the idea of perspective. It is quite obvious that when the youth is involved, there is a unique approach to ideas. That's simply meaning that we have better platforms, a better ideology. Because when we say that Gen Z is very different from the millennials or from the previous generations, well, that could come off in a negative way that, okay, they are not as um, conservative or of sorts, right? But obviously, be involved in social media platforms and just different ideologies and the environment and the atmospheres that the Gen Z is involved in, they have a different perspective. And oftentimes, these perspectives might be the exact solution that we actually need. And just to explore these different perspectives, now they might, they might not be the best solutions, but considering them is like a major um, point of benefit to the global society. Um, thirdly, social empowerment. Well, we live in a society. Every member of the society has an important role to play in it. And every member of the society deserves an opportunity to be empowered. Letting the youth actually lead initiatives gives an opportunity to empower the entire society because it builds self-esteem and it essentially gives them the uh, confidence. Empowering youth is essentially giving the foundation to the future political leaders. If the current political leaders, when they step into office, when they step into the house, they spend a lot of time trying to understand how does policy making work, how does decision making work, what are the impacts, what are the processes, right? But if they were already aware of this, because they were already involved from a young age, that would have initially developed that foundation, which in itself would inherently result in better policy making because they initially had that foundation and that empowerment might help make better political leaders who are more aware. And again, all of this would lead to a better impact for the entire global society and we might as well solve the issues that we're currently facing. Okay, now moving on to COP28 and how this aligns with their goals, because that's the thing that will happen in November, and it's a key policy conference that we have to align towards, right? Um, as you all know, Alcoy is submitting policy documents to the COP28. Um, I will read out the quote mentioned on the screen, which is, youth hold the key to our shared future. Their passion and innovation ignite change. We are committed to enhancing youth participation within the COP28 presidency and the COP process strengthening platforms that advance the youth climate agendas, formalizing their involvement, relaying and amplifying their voices, and empowering them through capacity building. Uh, said, and I quote, by the Minister of Youth and COP28 Youth's Champion, Her Excellency Shama al Mazuri. So this basically shows you that the COP28 is committed. There have been multiple speeches, addresses by the president and the leaders of uh, COP28 about youth involvement. And the youth play a very key process to all of this. What we're here to show you is that this actually matters and this 
is recognized by world leaders. Uh, within the COP, as you know, Alcoys come together, which is the local conferences of the youths. They bring out policy discussions. They bring out discussions that pertain to the youth and their solutions. And then when you get all of this together, this is then sent to the regional conference of the youth, which then again discusses this. This is sent to the conference of the youth. And finally, this document is presented in the COP28 in UAE, which will happen now. So this document would go on the desks of world leaders, and that's the impact that youth would have. Now, as a result of this, and I think the major international organization working towards this is Youngo. Uh, I won't go too detailed into Youngo because a previous speaker has already spoken about it very uh, beautifully. But Youngo is the official youth constituency of the UNFC. See, without them, we wouldn't be here. And without them, we wouldn't be presenting this in the local conference of the youth. Um, within the Young Go, youth policies play a key impact. They basically advocate for everything and anything, youth and climate change. And we not only appreciate them, we respect them in their manner and to get youth policy inputs forward. And that is the biggest example of a recognized process within the UN system for making space for youth. And this can only go upwards and forward and become better from here on through more initiatives that participate and align with Youngo to get these conferences together. Um, I think it has been quite evident throughout history that you can never really have a better future if you do not understand how the past went out with, and you do not understand what were the initial foundations of anything uh, that you are currently doing. Um, Essentially, you cannot really understand what is the importance of youth-led initiatives and how you can go about with it in the future unless we actually understand how did it start. So speaking in the context of the UAE, um, sorry, in the early 1970s, the late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan al Nahyan, the founding father of the UAE, he had established an environment agency uh, in Abu Dhabi, which was the EAD, and this essentially managed the Emirates' entire uh, all the natural resources, and it played a key role in educating and empowering the youth in environmental issues. This created a foundation, which then eventually led to the establishment of an Emirates Youth Council in 2013. Now, this council was the backbone of all the youth initiatives that we have in the UAE. This uh, council essentially established several initiatives which not only empowered the youth to participate in these initiatives, but be inspired enough to actually make their own after this. Um, a couple of examples of the events by the youth council are presented over here. So the youth circles, it was basically um, a dialogue where the youth gathered together to discuss how the environmental policies and engagements, and they started innovating solutions about global challenges. We then have Fakhr, which, which was also an annual forum, which also brought together a lot of young people and they celebrated their na nation's heroes. Essentially, when someone uh, does something for their country, the youth come together in this forum and they discuss it. They understand what had these heroes done for their country, especially in the context of environmental policy and better appreciating it because they feel the sense of pride. And this pride is nothing but inspiration and motivation to do something similar. Uh, we then had a 100 mentors program. Well, I think it is quite obvious that despite having youth-led initiatives, we are still young, we are still the youth, and we do not have enough experiences, right? Obviously, we have to look up to people, but that access is quite difficult because it's not so easy to get in touch with other people, other people who are more experienced, right? So in that context, this initiative, what it did was it got 100 mentors relevant to environmental policy and gave the youth an opportunity, a platform to connect to these individuals who had a lot of experience and help them make their own initiatives. We then had similar uh, events like the Arab Youth Forum and the National Youth Dialogue. After that, we have the Youth Hub. Uh, it's actually a really cool place. Um, essentially, it's a place where the youth can go for free. They can work together. They can have conference rooms. They can have meetings over there. They can host events over there. Um, actually, the last Elkhoi last year was hosted in the Youth Hub. So it's actually a really cool place for young um, people who want to start their own organizations and they do not have the resources. They could utilize these resources, these premises, to start off their organization. Fun fact, the Arab Youth Environment Program initiated in these premises. Around three years ago, we were just sitting at a conference room and discussing ideas to have better impact and raise more awareness. And that is where the idea of the Arab Youth Environment Program initiated from. And that's where we established ourselves much better. 
So we do have a lot of credit due towards the Youth Hub because it provides a platform which I think many people can utilize efficiently if they actually know about it. So one of our main goals is also raising awareness of the initiatives available in Dubai already and inspiring the youth to make their own as well. Right. So what next? What is the UAE government planning apart from these initiatives? Um, do note that within these, you can take part. You can actually be engaged as you are engaged in the conference today. So the first one is the UAE's Operation 300 Billion Initiative aims to attract 300 billion in foreign investments by the industrial sector by 2031, providing opportunities for sustainable business ventures by youth. Uh, furthermore, I believe there are competitions and more initiatives across the UAE where the youth can actually go and propose their initiatives as business ideas, as business pitches that then get funding to become proper initiatives. Uh, second one is the UAE government has announced its plan to plant 50 million trees, presenting a significant opportunity for youth to participate in reforestation efforts. Here, um, even during the course of Elcoy, we have seen a similar initiative. And throughout the country, we have tried to make a reforestation efforts possible. Uh, this is one ongoing initiative that plans to get this achieved, which is 50 million trees, which is an amazing number. Uh, lastly, the UAE government is also working to in integrate sustainable education into school curriculum. In 2020, the Ministry of Education launched the Sustainable Schools Initiative, which aims to make all schools in the UAE sustainable by 2030. This can include through the curriculum, through syllabuses, where you can participate and you can raise awareness about it within your own or through the premises or through other factors within the community and the facilities of the school that can become more sustainable. So the UAE government is already taking these initiatives and to be a factor to those, to be a part of those is something that all the youth should inspire and that all the mentors should actually help the youth, encourage them and build on them to partake in this along with the government and different agencies. Uh, now that gives you an overview into youth-led sustainability initiatives that gives you an overview into what has happened in the UAE and what is happening in the UAE and potentially what you can do. But now we will go into a bit about our organization so we can tell you that how you can actually really do this if you want to because we run you through our process, through what we are doing. And if you as the youth are interested in starting your own initiative, starting your own process or organizing your own, then this is how it we can help you out. Um, we will first start with what we are. Um, I believe we haven't introduced the Arabian Youth Environment Program before. Uh, we basically are working towards cultivating a generation of environmentally conscious leaders. So we come across and we focus on youths on all areas. It's not only the older youth that have to take action and lead initiatives, it's also the younger youth. They have to participate in it. They have to be an active voice. And we aim to provide that platform. We aim to do this by cleanup campaigns, recycling drives, um, conferences. As you see, we have co-organized Elcoy. And we work along these initiatives to actually give the youth a more accessible platform, a platform that they can easily be a part of. And that's what AYEP promotes. We also work on blogs, research, and many other things that the youth would actually be interested in. So that's basically about our organization, a very small overview. We started this, as Hassan said, very minutely. We started this with an idea. We worked it towards a website, a social media page. We had a timeline. We looked towards attracting about 200 volunteers. We went slowly. Of course, we didn't have 200 volunteers at once. Um, we weren't awarded this conference as soon as we came into existence. We had to work for it. We had to actually do smaller initiatives, do smaller things towards the climate. And then when people saw our work, the work increased. People actually came to us after that. And we had an increase in our volunteers. We had an increase in the size of our initiatives. And eventually with this small growth, you can also see that, you know, your initiative can be successful. Um, now we are just, again, at the start of our university process. We are not working with any connections. We don't have any resources. We have almost no budget. So it's plainly organized through, you know, resources readily available, resources that you can find anywhere and everywhere, like social media platforms or reaching out through marketing, online marketing, and 
organizing this through group chats and just forums. So that's our way of going through it. As Hassan previously mentioned, we use the Youth Hub in the UAE to actually plan out our formal meetings. So the idea of this being, if we really put our mind to it, nothing is impossible and we can actually make change. Now, finally, we have our QR code. Um, as Amir said, we host uh, a lot of workshops and we have beach cleanups, park cleanups, recycling campaigns and drives and all of that. We partner with the Embers WWF and the EEG to host these events. So if you want to be a part of this, you can uh, scan our QR code. This will guide you to our Linktree link where you can access all our blogs which have been previously posted. You can access um, our Instagram pages where we are constantly updating what we are doing, how you can participate and all of that. You could also access a form to sign up to be a volunteer or a writer for our research blogs and all of that. This link will essentially, this code will essentially guide you to everything that we do and we can stay updated and we look forward to connecting with all of you. Yes. Um, no. Um, just to end it, sorry, really quickly, um, it was a pleasure ha being here and having this platform to actually speak to you as the youth. Um, it was a pleasure and we hope you took something from this. Um, we also love to co-organize Elko and we hope you had a lovely experience. Uh, thank you, Evans, and thank you to all the other organizers for working with us. Yara, can you come? Mm. <laughs> Yes, thank you again to uh, the Arabian Youth uh, Environment Program for sharing so, uh, so many useful tips. Uh, up next, we have Yara Al Jatan, which is a coordinator uh, projects management uh, at the Arab Youth Center. <laughs> Thank you very much for the claps. Um, is this working? It is working. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, first of all, oh, wow, this is kind of tall, isn't it? Um, thank you all for making the time to be here. Uh, I know there's, it's like midterm season and there are finals coming up and there are papers. Uh, so really appreciate you guys, you know, making the time to be here. But honestly, I've, I've heard all the presentations that have come up today and they're all very, very useful. So I hope you guys had some things to take away from them. Um, I'm just going to take a quick step back and introduce myself and the Arab Youth Center. Um, I know it's not a huge crowd we have here, but I will rely a little bit on your interaction. Uh, have you guys heard of the Arab Youth Center before? Show of hands. We have one and that's it. <laughs> okay, so um, the Arab Youth Center is basically an NGO that works with the government. Um, to empower youth uh, in multiple fields. So we do climate action, uh, we have a program on podcasts, on technology, um, so on and so forth. Um, I'm a projects coordinator there and I am focused on the climate file when it comes to, um, you know, uh, youth and climate action. Um, sorry, <laughs> just give me a minute. All right, so... Um, I think I've heard a lot of people say today something that's very important. They kept they kept reiterating that, um, you know, you, there are small steps, but if we put our mind to it, we can we can get so much done. And I I I love that that has been reiterated throughout the day because it's true um, that genuinely simply engaging with people about climate um, would take you a long way. And I'll I'll show you how that gets done in just a minute. Um, 
before I delve into before I delve into anything, uh, I want to say that 60% of the population in the Arab region are under the age of 30. So most of our population are actually youth. Uh, and to reiterate something that Her Excellency Shema has once said, we need all hands on deck to solve a problem that is global, right? Uh, and with 60% of the population, we need you guys <laughs> to kind of help us solve this climate crisis or situation. Um, and I don't know if you guys have noticed, but over the past couple of years, you know, climate was a big deal in the region, but it wasn't like an urgent issue. We weren't really focused on climate change. And recently, we've seen an increase on that. Um, and the reason why is it's very interesting. It's kind of like... Um, it's because the climate change crisis has kind of come to us, but in the best way. So through COP27 and through COP28, um, there has been more focus on climate change, uh, not only with organizations and governments, but also with the general public and the, com and the community. And so um, Elkoy is, for example, a huge example of that, right? So we are working towards COP28, let's host an Elkoy, let's uh, build capacities, let's connect people, let's advance them, let's, you know, um, empower their voices. Um, I do want to ask, has anyone here heard, I know you're, you guys are taking part in Elkoi right now, but have you guys heard of Koi 18 before? One, two, okay, okay. Okay, we have <laughs> a couple hands in the room, which is a little bit better. So you guys may be aware that with the Conference of Youth, there's local, regional, and uh, global accounts of this conference. Um, so this local obviously happens per country. And then uh, our Koi Mina is actually happening happening in one or two weeks in uh, Oman. And then um, the global Koi, which brings all Koi's around the world together, um, is actually happening on November 26th to November 28th in the UAE. And the Arab Youth Center is one of the people hosting this conference. Um, I think you guys, as part of Alcoy, have been working as well on a global youth statement, correct? Um, so a, a product of you guys being here is you sit together and you say, okay, so what, what do we want to, uh, to happen in, 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 um, when it comes to climate action, climate change? What do we want to see implemented? What are our solutions? What are our concerns, in a sense? Um, and local COIs each develop their own papers. Uh, it merges into regional global COIs, they put their inputs in, and then finally at COI 18, we actually get this global youth statement and we hand it over to the COP28 presidency uh, for their consideration during negotiations. So this just comes to show you that really it is as simple as being involved in conversations, being involved in events, taking part, listening in, talking to people, connecting to people, that really advances you as a climate advocate um, and champions your voice. It makes sure that your voice is imprinted into this global challenge. And this is very important because the Arab region is not as involved as other regions when it comes to, um, particularly the youth, when it comes to um, climate action and climate involvement. Um, so, and, and I think you guys would know, climate change is not a one size fits all, um, right? So we have different perspectives and different solutions per region, per country. Um, so we need you guys to come in and say, this is, this is how we do it in my country. This is our narrative. These are our problems because these need to be accounted for as well because these matter just as much as all the other Western uh, narratives. So my presentation has a lot of QR codes because I have so many resources that I want to share with you guys because there's so much out there to tap into. Um, so I hope that it would be of some help to you guys. Okay, so first thing I wanna talk about is ACE. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with what ACE is, but ACE is basically the UNFCC strategy uh, about how we could empower our communities. So their strategy is education, training, public awareness, public participation, public access to information and international cooperation. So this falls in line very closely with what the YCC team or the youth champion team for COP28 are trying to do with the youth, uh, where we're trying to, it's, it's called PAVE, the PAVE strategy, which is basically uh, participation, action, voice, and education. Um, kind of like a rounded approach to ensure that your youth are included, that your youth are empowered, and that they're connected, and that they advance all together. Quick show of hands, how many people are going to be at COP28 this year? 
or planning on being. Oh, awesome, nearly the entire room, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, and I know the presentation before me has briefly touched on what UNGO is, but again, I'd, this link over here, if you scan it, you can actually be a member of UNGO. Uh, and I feel like this would be very important for the region in particular, because there's not a huge representation of Arab youth within UNGO. Um, and what's so great about this is UNGO, uh, as mentioned previously in, in the presentation before me, it is the official youth arm, in essence, for the UNFCC. And anyone can be a part of UNGO. As long as you're a youth, you're interested in climate, you can be a part of UNGO. Uh, so you're officially would be part of a community for the UNFCC for climate change. And what's so great about this is they have separate working groups. So let's just say you're interested in water in particular. There's a working group within UNGO that focuses on water. And so they meet every once in a while and they sit down together and they talk about solutions. Um, and ways forward. And I think, again, what's so great about events like this and communities like Hyungo is that they're kind of like a hotspot of opportunities. So once you are part of this network, then you're just exposed to so many opportunities. Um, and I'm gonna touch on this later. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll touch on, I'll keep that in for, 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 for a little bit. But just back to Hyungo and their working groups. So let's just say that you're interested in water, um, you have weekly meetings and so on and so forth. But what's so great about it too is that UNGO, because they're an official part of the UNFCC, during negotiations, um, UNGO actually has an intervention. They actually have a spot where they speak to the parties and the delegations during negotiations. And if you're part of a working group, you can sit down with them and tell them uh, and, and agree on whether or what, what you would like to be presented during this intervention. So you'd have a say, in essence, in one way or the other, you're contributing to the negotiations, which is really mind boggling if you think about it. It's, it's, it's a really great way to, you know, put your voice out there. So yeah, become a part of UNGO. Um, now I want to introduce you to the Arab Youth Council for Climate Change. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of us before, uh, but again, at the Arab Youth Center, we empower and enable youth. So one of the projects that we did is the Arab Youth Council for Climate Change. And it's, uh, I think I'm very, very excited to say this, but this council uh, goes on for two years. And this, these two years, so we started in 2021, 2023 right now. So our cohort is graduating and we're actually going to onboard the next batch of our council um, at the end of the year. So I really hope that you guys stay up to date and apply to be part of our council um, because you, you might just be part of the next cohort. Um, so let me tell you about the benefits of being part of the Arab Youth Council for Climate Change. So as of right now, we have 12 members from around the world. We're a regional organization, so we work throughout the Arab community or the Arab region. Um, so we gather people and what we do is we listen to them because uh, they're climate experts. And we tell them, okay, so you have a project in mind. How do we help you realize this project? Um, and what's so great is, and this is what I wanted to talk about, uh, when it comes to such events and such organizations and such communities, there's, if you think about it, there's kind of a gap because there's people who are interested in climate change, who are interested in climate action and they want to take part. And then there are organizations who kind of have opportunities. But where's the connection between this and this? Because oftentimes it's difficult to connect. You're there, you don't know what to do, and organizations don't know how to reach or find their youth. Uh, so that's where organizations like QNGO, like the Arab Youth Center, like MENA Climate Week, uh, like COIS, this is the connect that basically bridges the gap between the youth and the opportunities that are available to them. And so uh, what's great about the council is whenever a, 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 an organization has an opportunity for Arab youth, they come to us and they ask us, okay, can you nominate two or three youth uh, within this field? You have this opportunity for them. And then we take these uh, opportunities forward to our youth. Uh, obviously, this advances our youth and become the, their their profiles are highlighted, and people would know who they are, and they'd grow through just being part of a council because you have someone to back you up, you have someone to push you forward, to to kind of give you a platform in essence. Um, so yeah, that's about the uh, Arab Youth Council for Climate Change. As of right now, our council members have come up with multiple projects. Uh, one of them actually being the Arab Youth. Um, climate network. So basically we have our council, but as you can tell, there are only 12 people and we have like hundreds of people who have applied. So if you don't get to be part of our Arab Youth Council, you can actually be part of our network, our extended network. As of right now, throughout the region, we have over a thousand Arab youth participated in our network and we share these opportunities with them. Um, Schneider Electric, for example, previously mentioned that they have a hackathon going on. 
So we were actually supporting them with that hackathon, specifically with outreach. People come to us for outreach because we have the youth for their opportunities. Um, so we, we, sh we share these opportunities with our network uh, and then they can register. Uh, so yeah, I'd really encourage you not only to, to look at the initiatives we have, the, research, uh, the reports that we have, but also maybe take part in our network because you will be exposed to so many opportunities. All right. Uh, some projects I want to talk to you guys about. Um, again, as I mentioned, we have a lot of uh, initiatives and reports within our council. And these are all like ideas that our council have come up with. And we've supported them with funding and with connection and with exposure. And through that, their projects kind of grew. And just to show you how simple an idea can be. So one of our council members said that they want to create a toolkit series. Um, basically a toolkit series that's specifically for Arab youth, something about that talks about Arab challenges with Arab solutions, guiding youth towards climate action. Um, and it's honestly one of our most, it's a very simple idea, but it's one of our most successful projects. As of right now, we have four toolkits and I'd really, really encourage you guys to look at them because with everything that everyone has said, um, it, they're very technical, very great, every, all the other presentations that have been mentioned. But I think the toolkits will help you connect to how to get there. How do you achieve these things? So we have one on green jobs and green skills. So it gives you a bunch of resources of like, hey, did you know that Coursera, for example, provides this course on, on green skills? Uh, when you apply for a job into a green job, what skills do you want to highlight? Uh, we have another one about starting your own startup. How do you start your own startup? Because um, it can be really taunting and intimidating. How do you get your funding? How do you get your resources? Uh, what's your action plan? Who do you reach out to? We have one about sustainable consumerism. Uh, we, have, we have so many resources that you guys can tap into. Uh, in addition to that, we have a, a course called the Climate Literacy Course. Again, all our projects that we do are specifically Arab focused. Uh, so we have animated videos that teach people about climate change, very, very basic stuff about climate change. Um, but the great thing about, and, and we have, I think around, as of right now, over 10,000 learners throughout the region who have completed this course. Um, so, you know, it's just a great course, uh, great resource to utilize. But what I wanna emphasize here is with learning, with training, um, it's good to be proactive. So let's say we have these resources, that's great. And you've learned, you've, you've taken this toolkit and you've learned so much about uh, green skills, for example. Um, I think it would be very benefit to have proactive learning in that if you learn something, then spill it over to your community, teach them as well. And um, I, I think this creates such a big splash and it, it, it really emphasizes you as a climate leader and it's something that's really, really easy where if, if you're in a university, for example, if you have a club, you can have um, one session within your um, environment club that teaches people about um, one of the toolkits. You could do a training yourself uh, or you could introduce them to the course and you can go over the course together with them. Um, and actually, when it comes to um, ap applying to the Conference of Youth, for example, to COI-18, this is one of the things that we evaluate is, okay, we're going to train you, we're going to empower you, but is this going to spill over to your community? Because that's, that's very, very important to get all hands on deck and to get everyone involved. And then finally, we have our roundtable series. I've kept this to the, to the last because this doesn't involve youth as much as the other two. Uh, but there are a bunch of reports that talk about, that bring companies together and they tell the companies, um, let's, let's, let's just think about, for example, consumerism. When it comes to consumerism, how can we support our youth in becoming green and sustainable consumers? So we sit down together and we think of a bunch of ideas and we do have youth representatives who kind of feed into that and who talk about, okay, um, how do we go about this? And then after that, we publish a bunch of, bunch of reports that you can find by scanning that QR code. And we take these reports and we give them to businesses and we tell them, hey, you want to get youth more involved? This is how you do it. Um, so again, this is just a great reference where if you want to push a certain company to do a certain thing, you could give them this list of suggestions or recommendations. It's really all about how you tap into your network and how you utilize your resources. Um, and we have a bunch of that. We have a bunch of resources. So be sure to check them out. All right. Lastly, I uh, just want to touch on hackathons really, really quickly. Um, there has been, we have, we have partnered on at least four hackathons this year. This just comes to show you how willing companies are also 
uh, to support their youth in their endeavors. There really are so many opportunities out there, but if you're just engaged and you're active and, and you keep a lookout, then there's so much you could be exposed to. Uh, one of our initiatives at the Arab Youth Center is called the Arab Youth Pitches. So we had the Arab Youth Pitches last year in Koi 17 in Egypt. And we were able, so basically it was a pitching uh, competition. Uh, we got people, some youth together and we told them, pitch to us uh, your idea of a green startup. How would that look like? What's, what's your plan? And we had a group of judges and we graded them and we got three winners. Uh, and we were able to give each of them 15,000 US dollars to kind of support their, their startup. Uh, because again, with 60% of the population, these are the people you rely on to green your economy and to help you through the energy transition. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have another Youth Pitches round very, very soon. So I'd urge you to keep a lookout for that and apply in case you have any solutions in mind uh, that you could champion or pitch. Another one is the UE Youth Green Challenge. This is the um, green hackathon that Schneider was actually talking about. Registrations are currently open, actually. So if you'd like to register to be part of Schneider's um, hackathon, then you can absolutely take part in that. Again, um, no idea is too small. You never know. I think apply and see what happens because really you could come up with something uh, and it could be life changing, I think. And then finally, we have the Man Social Incubator. Uh, I'm not sure if we have a lot of people from Abu Dhabi here, uh, but Man and Start AD uh, have, are also great um, hubs to tap into if you want to know more about hackathons. They usually run a lot of hackathons and they have a social incubator. It's, it's currently closed, but it's uh, a great resource to keep a lookout for because I think they have yearly iterations of this. So if not this year, maybe next year. All right, my final slide. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Uh, I just wanted to urge you guys to uh, maybe give us a follow because um, with Elkois and Arcois coming to a conclusion, uh, we really hope to take everything that you've learned and all the connections that you've made and all the you know inputs that you have given us uh, and champion them in uh, Koi. Um, registrations are, how many people, is anyone taking part in Koi 18? You're, you're accepted as a delegate. Okay, amazing, we'll see you there. Uh, it's going to be at Expo City. It's going to be the first time that Koi 18 is in the same grounds as COP28. Uh, and we're very, very excited. We're going to hopefully work on some virtual attendance so you guys can follow along. Um, and yeah, I, I think as a final note, I just, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to be a part of negotiations, to be part of climate action, to be part of solutions. Um, it really just takes tapping into the right networks. I just want to say one more thing that popped into my head, but even being a negotiate, accredited at COP28, I know a lot of people face challenges with that, um, but there are organizations who are given badges for COP28, for example, who are registered in the UNFCC. So, so long as you're connected to the right organizations, then they'd be able to provide you with badges because it's part of their mandate to empower youth like you. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, if you have any questions about Koi 18, uh, you can reach us on our website or Instagram. Um, same thing with the Arab Youth Center and with the Arab Youth Council for Climate Change. Uh, once again, thank you for being here. I know it's a hard time for university students right now. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Yes, thank you so much, Yara, for giving us so many resources, and I'm pretty sure many of us will be using them. Um, next up, I'd like to welcome uh, Mariam Al-Hafati, uh, uh, a biochemist and science researcher at uh, the Fajera Research Center.
Hello everyone. Thank you for inviting me here today. It's such an honor to such an honor to speak at local conference of you, um, of youth highlight technology driven solution. My name is Mariam Lehfeti, a marine researcher and um, at Fujairah Research Center and graduated from UAE University uh, biochemistry degree. So I would like to start my presentation with the quote uh, by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the president of the UAE. Youth are, are the pillar of progress and development in any society. The emerging nations are the ones that invest in youth, work to qualify them, empower them, and utilize their um, abilities optimally because they are the most precious wealth of the nations, the uh, resource that never runs out and the fundamental to any country development, construction and uh, progress. As a youth, we are very lucky that our uh, presidents and ru uh, ruler in the UAE opened the door for us and engaged us in such a environmental challenges like uh, environmental sustainability and uh, climate change. So by engaging the youth in these challenges, it will pave the way for a more sustainable future and for uh, by innovation and uh, technology, we can tap into their interest and the skills and this will affect the success of this effort. Now I would like to, uh, to share with you some of research projects that we worked on it in Fujaira Research Center uh, as a sustainable practice. Firstly, we have the vegetation mapping project. This the objective of the, this project is to create a map that show a distribution of the native plant, which is cedar, summer, and Gafa uh, trees in Fujairah. Mainly, we focused on uh, three areas in Fujairah, Misafi, Deba, and Fujairah City. We extract uh, the area images from satellite, then we analyze the image and uh, create a map. We went to the field to, uh, to identify each species in the, uh, in the area and uh, train an artificial intelligence mod model to identify the species. From this map, uh, uh, this map will help us to monitor the, uh, the green area in Fujairah and to also to, to monitor the health of each plant species and the uh, growing uh, pattern of each species also. Uh, to ensure the sustainable development and the greener area in Fujairah. The second project is Cyber Farm. The Cyber Farm is such like a smart uh, greenhouse. Uh, it is a vertical, uh, vertical hydroponic farm, which were, uh, which the growing plant depend on water and nutrients rather than soil. Our system uh, work uh, independently, fully independent, all the parameters like temperature, uh, nutrient, brightness, uh, and irrigation uh, monitored by uh, sensors. So the, the system can, um, can adjust uh, all the, uh, all the uh, all these parameters depend on uh, plant requirement. For example, if the temperature outside is uh, very high, the system itself can adjust the temperature uh, to ensure the growing of the plant. And this system, uh, help, uh, this system is very good example of sustainability and for food security. So we can grow any plant uh, in very ex extreme environment and uh, with the bitter yield and uh, cons consume a lower water. The third project is water resource mapping and catch 
sorry, weather forecasting model. So in Fujairah area, we have a coastal area and mountain. Weather is very different in the coastal area uh, than the mountains area. So we have to uh, establish um, weather prediction framework for each city itself. In Fujairah Research Center, we uh, we uh, we implement a 20 weather station in the coastal area and mountain area. This is um, uh, a microclimate weather uh, forecasting framework to predict the uh, to predict the weather, uh, like rainfall pattern, wind speed, and wind direction. To mitigate the uh, the uh, environmental problem that caused by the uh, by the climate change, like the uh, the uh, the flood that we have it last year in Fujairah, uh, caused by the rainfall pattern. So now we can mitigate and uh, minimize this disaster that will uh, happen by climate change and track the uh, climate. Uh, At the end, the youth are the uh, are the decision maker for the future, and uh, the one who's uh, who will face um, more sequencing uh, the more who will face the more sequencing problem in the future. So we need to engage them in this from now to qualify them and uh, give them the responsibility of this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Mariam, for sharing what you do at Fijera. Uh, next up, I'd like to invite Evans Kyoko to present the winners of the competition. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone for your, for your patience and uh, being here with us. So uh, my name is Evans Kiyoko. Uh, I work in ICBA uh, in partnerships and resource mobilization. And additionally, I was the focal point for the organizing committee of the local conference. And we are very happy today that we made it to the end of uh, this great event. And now I want to present the winners of our challenge. We had a challenge uh, to the youth how they can use their creativity for sustainability. And we received submissions and uh, the organizing committee managed to select three winners of the competition. And to the, the first winner, goes to yalamagroves.a. Please come. Please welcome Faris, a 17-year-old from, uh, from Dubai College. He has been uh, doing this great project to make sure we give the gift of mangrove planting by using the technology platform to make sure we conserve our biodiversity. Congratulations. I welcome Dr. Suel to give. So we received a gift voucher from Ulsam Foods, courtesy of Global Shepherds Dubai Yap.
And additionally to this voucher, you will receive a shopping voucher through your email to the Givement, Giving Movement UAE, and you go there and shop uh, uh, fashion for sustainability. But don't, don't use it for Amazon. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> it's only for the Giving Movement. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have another one. Let me see. Let's go. So uh, we have another presentation from uh, Anwisha uh, Nat. She's using technology uh, to come up with the app, which uh, is helping uh, to have a carbon neutral mindset. So this is uh, one of uh, submissions. We saw that the use of technology to achieve uh, sustainability and reduce the carbon footprint. So we welcome uh, Anisha. Then to our last uh, winner, she was not able to come. She produced this amazing uh, poster, how we can use uh, carbon labeling to, uh, to, to, to allow consumers to make sustainable food choices. We usually see on our cars or our fridges, uh, the stickers showing uh, uh, this item uh, is, is, uh, is saving energy, but we don't realize the food, uh, producing food uh, requires a lot of energy. So we saw this was very creative and we are going, she's going to be picking a gift uh, tomorrow at Iqba. Thank you very much, Dr. Sway. Thank you. Convey, convey our regards and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all the winners and congratulations. Thank you, Evans, for uh, presenting the gifts and hope all the winners enjoy their uh, presents. <laughs> so next up, we've got uh, Sheikha Shafar coming back up on stage to present the youth statement, the UAE youth statements. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm very honored to be presenting the UAE Youth Statement uh, as an active member of the UAE Youth and a student of Zaid University. So we, the young people and children of the United Arab Emirates, representing a diverse, forward-thinking generation under the age of 35, advocate for the following 10 essential themes in a pursuit of climate action and sustainability. This statement received insights and input from 136 uh, youth based in the UAE who participated in the local conference of youth in uh, the UAE. So the first theme is youth engagement and climate action and sustainability. 
we recognize the urgency of youth involvement and commitment to, the, to driving change and achieving the sustainable development goals in less than seven years. Young people are the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change and will bear the most consequences. For the reasons, the involvement and participation of youth in climate negotiations is not negotiable. For the second theme, we have climate change adaptation and mitigation. We aim to develop actionable solutions that are relevant to the local context of the UAE. And we recognize the threats posed by rising sea level, salinity, heat waves, and dust storms. And we advocate for the adap adaptive technologies for water and soil desalinization. The call for all stakeholders to ensure just transition as a mitigative measure to climate change. For the third theme, we have education for sustainable development. Um, we advocate for an education system that instills awareness and sustainable practices. And we celebrate the role of art in raising awareness, inspiring action, and expressing the urgency of sustainability issues. Um, next, we have sustainable, res sustainable natural resource management and biodi biodiversity conservation. We are committed to safeguarding the natural resources and biodiversity for a sustainable future. And we consider the biodiversity strategy of the United Arab Emirates 2014 to 10 to 2021 that focused on mainstreaming biodiversity in all economic and social sectors, reinforcement of knowledge, sharing and capacity building for upgrading and addressing biodiversity management, improvement of biodiversity status through habitat protection, genetic diversity, and restoration of degraded ecosystems. Next, we have food and nutritional security. We support the UAE National Food Security Strategy 2051 to build an effective food security model, drive research and development and technology-led enablement, ensuring quality data and information availability, enhancing the availability of quality human capital for food security functions and engaging the community to shift to food security notions and behavioral enabling. Next, we have waste management, food loss and waste, sustainable lifestyles, and circular economy. We call the urgent need to reduce the high rates of food loss and waste in the UAE. We understand the strains on the ecosystem by agricultural industry, which is worsened by food losses and waste. And we promote sustainable waste management practices and embracing circular economy practices for a cleaner, more sustainable UAE. Next, we have the private sector contribution to empower youth and corporate sustainability. We support the private sector youth-led sustainability initiatives, and we encourage the private sector uh, partnerships with other stakeholders, nonprofits, organization, non-governmental organization, and governmental organizations in youth-led sustainability initiatives. Next, we have climate misinformation, climate reporting, and journalism. We advocate for responsible and accurate climate reporting to combat misinformation and foster informed decision-making. And last but not least, we have climate action through the lens of gender. We recognize the importance of a gender inclusive climate action and empowerment in addressing climate change challenges. As the youth of the United Arab Emirates, we commit to addressing the climate crisis and contributing to a sustainable future uh, for our nation and the world. Together, we strive, for, um, we strive to create actionable solutions, faster innovation, and advocate for a greener, more sustainable tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheikha, for uh, presenting the youth statement. Up next, we I'd like to invite Noor Al Jandi, uh, the proposal development ma uh, specialist at and COP28 focal point, and Al Koi committee member at ICBA. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, with that, we will conclude our two-day Alcoy program. I truly believe that this year we have really met our goal and we were able to put 200 young people in the UAE at the heart of climate action, which was actually the theme that we chose for this year. We had more than 15 sessions and two workshops. We discussed, actually the, the discussions have exceeded our expectations. They were really very interactive and we were able to tackle key issues 
including biodiversity, climate finance, cl impact of climate change on gender, as well as corporate sustainability, the role of education like we discussed today, and many other critical uh, issues from a youth perspective. I also uh, would like to highlight that yesterday we ended the event with very actionable uh, uh, activities and we planted raft trees at Iqba. Raft trees, as you all know, they're very important and native to the UAE and they are, it is a tree that can actually grow under harsh climatic conditions and require very low water amounts. Coming from a nutrition and food security background, I would like to share with you a quick example on how us, the young generation, can actually be agents of change and really drive the climate, uh, climate agenda and also net zero goals. I remember a few years back, you would rarely find like healthy or vegetarian uh, options at restaurants. And now with the pressure that the young generations have put and the, their voices have been heard, they've actually held accountable all food retailers and food actors across the value chains that we really need to consider the impact that the climate change ha is having on, the cl uh, on food systems and we need to have more healthy and sustainable options. And now across all restaurants in the UAE and globally, you can always have vegetarian and even vegan and healthy options. Not only that, we're also talking now about the carbon footprint of food, which is also a very important topic. I believe Alcoy this year is really had an additional importance given that this is the year of sustainability and also we are having COP28 in just six weeks from now. My takeaway wish and message of Alcoy 2023 this year is actually to stay connected. I really hope that the outcome of this Alcoy would be to create this platform and will stay connected and hopefully produce an event or something together for COP28. And thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'd like to invite everyone for a 20 minute uh, lunch and then we could uh, move to the Climate Fresk workshop afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. 
Gracias. 